Well, thanks so much for having me. I, um, uh, it's, of course, difficult to imagine what to talk about, but uh, particularly given the first speaker. So how many of you have already experience in AI? I would say it's about half. How many of you have experience with language technologies? Uh, also maybe a third or so. So we have a mixed group. Some of you are probably experts. <coughs> And uh, some of you are uh, perhaps relatively new to this, so I'll try to keep this relatively um, general, of general understanding so that we all can get a feeling for what it is we're talking about. So um, again, my name is Alex Weibel. I'm the director of a center called the International Center for Advanced Communication Technologies. It's uh, both at Carnegie Mellon University and at University of Karlsruhe in uh, Germany. And, um, we run a network of institutes uh, around the world with whom we collaborate and we have students also exchanging. And, uh, um, and, um, and so in this context, we have been working a great deal on the main topic of what we are actually doing, which is working on um, uh, advanced communication technologies. What does it take for people to communicate in a very uh, modern way, in a futuristic way, and what can technology contribute to this? So it's a center that we've operated for now almost 25 years. And uh, we have, of course, a lot of contacts with industry and with, with government groups. And as you will see later, also started a number of companies to take what we are learning in the lab and taking it into practical application. So that's why I have a fondness for what you're doing here at the Pi School, because it is really all about coming up with really cool new technologies and then seeing how we can really solve problems in the real world. And then once we have the problems in the real world, don't just somehow look at it as just th throwing it over the fence. That's what traditionally universities like to do. They just write papers and hope that somebody out there will read them. Uh, while in reality what really should happen is that there is a constant dialogue and also feedback from the practical problems again back into the, uh, into the, into the research. So one of my, um, the, so among the companies that we started, uh, we always have actually worked with students who, who came from the research lab, who had an interest in being part of a startup company, and then also worked in the company. And one of my students who uh, did work in this last one that got acquired by Facebook, he once said, oh, you know, doing startup company was great until we had customers. So. <laughs> which sort of tells the thing when, when you really have real customers, real people out there using it, uh, you can't just blame them as being stupid, you know, for not really reading the manual or not really doing what, what scientists do, but you have to reach them where they are. You know, imagine whatever technology you're building should be technology that helps your grandmother and your, your, uh, you know, your relatives, etc. Even if they're non-techy people, uh, it ought to be that understandable. So that's always been behind, in the back of our minds, behind what we've been doing. And um, so when I started my uh, research work in, um, uh, as actually a, a student at MIT in, this, this in the 70s, in the late uh, 70s, which dates me, 1970. Uh, uh, so um, uh, I remember um, being shocked when I learned about the instruction set of the PDP-11, uh, that it actually only had one instruction to deal with the output and the input. It was reading a character and writing a character. And I just said, how can this be the case? You know, that all of these instructions are for the machine to be entertaining itself with instructions as opposed to communicating with the, with the world around us. Boy, have things changed. You know, now we have self-driving cars, we have vision, we have speech, we have translation, etc. But it's, it's been a revolution that started back then where people started to realize it's really got to be about communication and reaching people uh, out there. So I started my career with that vision in mind and, and uh, sure enough what we see is um, you know the first thing that comes to mind we want to build interfaces with which we can communicate more naturally human machine interfaces. So your classical idea and interface uh, and yesterday I had a, a wonderful time uh, reminiscing with a a uh, colleague from Olivetti, because one of my early days, I was actually a consultant for Olivetti on this wonderful machine that was being built in Ivrea. Uh, they actually started working on a first uh, speech recognition engine where you could, in fact, enter a few words by voice, back in those days already. 
And so it was about, you know, can we talk to a machine? Now you realize very quickly though that communication is much more complicated, in particular today when we have media and data and the internet and it gets so much richer and things and the communication has to go with all of this information and that information is now also expressed in uh, human communication ways. When you go to the internet and when you have uh, a movie for example, it's not textual, it's not uh, nicely coded, it's really an environment where you again have speech and vision to deal with. And then very quickly you realize that that too is an oversimplification because we don't just interact with you hum between humans and machines, but we interact then also with robots, we interact with other humans, we may, have other, we may observe other humans interacting with machines and other humans, and we may want to have machines that observe an interaction between humans. So if you're dri driving along and you're, navig and you're talking with someone else in the car, how many times have I been annoyed by the navigation system to just rudely interrupting me when I'm uh, talking with someone else uh, to then sort of say a direction, of course. It ought to know when it's really important to interrupt and when not to interrupt. So the social, lack of social awareness is all still open areas of research that, that we're still engaged in. And particularly when you're now having robots, that household robots eventually that roam around, they have to become more socially aware. So we um, did quite a few projects. A while back we had a European um, uh, uh, program on... Um, uh, it was, they, they had these integrated projects and one of the ones that we had won was a project called CHILL, Computers Inter in the Human Interaction Loop. And what was behind it was with this notion that again, communication in, human, in the human <coughs> world is much richer than what we have traditionally viewed human-machine interaction. Um, for example, here, this is a slide I like to show because meetings, for example, and uh, classical meetings, uh, classical situation where you have humans engaging with humans, and it's not just what you say to another person, it's really observing the entire um, environment to have uh, contextual awareness, situational awareness that makes a meeting rich. That's why we prefer face-to-face -face, uh, meetings. So if uh, um, you've, let's say you came out of a meeting and somebody says to you, why did Joe get angry at Bob about the budget? It's a very simple question and you would be easily answering this question as a human if you attended that meeting. But if you now really ask this question, what would it take to have a, a robot in there answering the same question in the same way? Well, you st suddenly you realize it's, boo, it's just like uh, at least 10 different research areas, 20 research areas with uh, different research uh, experiences, both verbal and visual. So you need, to, you need to recognize speech, but you need to recognize the speaker's identity. You need to recognize their emotion, angry. You need to know what it is, what's the style of the interaction, which language they're talking in. You need to be able to summarize, find out the topic and uh, do something about handwriting. You need to visually identify people, gestures, body language, track faces, pose, uh, uh, facial expressions, focus of attention. We're amazingly good as human beings to figure out wh what people are attending to. And this even with a large crowd. When I give a lecture with uh, 300, 400 people in the room, you'd think that you wouldn't see people anymore because, and students think that way. They sit in the back and read the newspaper. And I say, would you please stop reading the newspaper or something like this? Or when they're sleeping, etc. You see it. You see the expression when they're bored, when they're excited. So even in such a large audience situation, it's still a two-way communication. They provide feedback to me and I can understand whether I'm engaging or not engaging or boring or over challenging them, etc. So we really are very, very good at that at humans and we can attend to this and, um, and we can, for example, find out focus of attention. What, what does it take to, f to figure out who's, what the focus of attention of human being is? What are they looking at? What their eyes are pointing to, what their whole body uh, pose is, etc. So it's a, it's a um, problem that we actually have worked on over the years in vision processing. So in Chill, a, a few years go, uh, ago, again, this was a project that ran between 2004 and 2008, 
we actually recorded such meetings in great detail, both, both visually and acoustically, and then we extracted all kinds of functional information to figure out what is a, point, a person pointing to, who is this, what does he say, where is he going to, what is the environment, to whom does he speak, where is he, etc., to start beginning to analyzing and understand these types of situations. Um, along came a very evaluation-based driven uh, uh, research agenda that would, uh, in fact, figure out uh, those sorts of things. You know, for example, doing face ID, and that's, of course, something that now has made a lot of progress in recent years to identify people. But again, you have to keep in mind that face ID in the real world, and again, uh, that's probably not new anymore, is actually challenging because people do all sorts of crazy stuff. First of all, you don't have usually mug shots, you have people on the side. 30% of the time when I speak to an audience, people do something with their face. And then tracking their faces is of course harder, finding out where they are in the room, who they're looking at. So this is what something that we were quite proud of to, for example, be able to track what people are looking at with their face and with their eyes. At the time, uh, 2004, 2005, around that time, nobody did that. And now, it, now it's, of course, becoming an important um, problem. Now you can combine all these things, of course, and then have speech combined with tracking gestures, pointing to something and saying something to figure out from the focus of attention, from the gesture and from the tracking and from what a, what a person is saying, uh, to put this all together and then I'd interpret or identify what a particular person has meant to say or meant to communicate. And communication is rich this way. It's not just what you say, it's what you're pointing to, what your body language says, is what your face is uh, tracking and looking toward, etc., and needs to be considered all together. Now, we're almost 10 years later now, and all of these things are now entering into practical domains. Again, Companies are now very interested in all of these things that I'm mentioning. If you have self-driving cars or communication systems, it becomes an, an important element to do this. One of the things we're doing at Karlsruhe is uh, implement a humanoid robot, which also has to interact in the real world. So the, all these uh, communication technologies become central here and uh, also collaborations with surgeons who have a classic hands-eye busy situation and you need to be able to communicate. They have also a very rich way of communicating with their staff and uh, so we had, you see here these cameras that they're wearing to try to uh, support them in their work. Um, we did implement a bunch of uh, Prototype systems, for example, a system that can tell when you're in a meeting and stops uh, patching fr uh, from patching calls through. So it would essentially stop a call when you're busy in a meeting and then reroute the call when both parties at the end are no longer busy uh, and make a more effective socially aware communication system. Uh, another uh, implementation or practical system we built at the time was a memory jog to try to figure out who are the people in the, in the meeting because we forget people's uh, names and then it's embarrassing. You're sitting with someone who you know you met before and you, but you don't remember where and when and what their name was, etc. So it wouldn't be nice to have a genie whisper in your ear, this is so and so and you met, just met him yesterday, you know. Uh, uh, or he works for you, <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, another thing that is of course a particular, uh, and then of course television for example has a lot of applications that's been something throughout our career and some of our colleagues here uh, have worked on these issues as well. To automatically do subtitling, that's now going into actually production. There are groups out of another project we ran recently called UBridge where automatic subtitling was done. Uh, Marcello is here, so the uh, FPK team was part of this uh, effort to do automatic uh, subtitling and translation of what was actually said on TV. So if you have Euro news and it's being broadcast in 10 different languages, you'd like to have an automatic interpretation of the speech. Now, um, television is a little bit more benign because you have, uh, you have a, a studio situation where it's being recorded. And we initially thought uh, particularly weather reports should be easy, particularly in England where it's always raining. Uh, so what could go wrong? But you find out very quickly when people get conversational, uh, things are a lot harder and we'll talk about this in a little bit in a moment. 
A particular love of mine, this uh, has been also uh, this whole problem of connecting people in a multilingual world by making them communicate with each other. So is it possible to build dialogue systems so I can speak in one language and the other person can uh, hear me in the other language and they can respond in their language back to me? And this is, of course, becoming huge. You know, there are now six billion phones. By 2020, people say 80% uh, of the world's population will have a smartphone in their pocket. 80% of the world's population will have a smartphone in their pocket. This is like if you had told me as a student that I would see the day in my lifetime where everyone carries a supercomputer in their pocket, I would have not believed it. And in my lifetime, we had seen you know, several orders of magnitude in computing in increases. And so the problem is no longer how to connect to people. I can reach somebody in the jungle in Indonesia as long as they have a cell phone, but I can't talk to them because they speak a different language. So the key, key problem now becomes how to deal with the 6,000 languages, not necessarily anymore the infrastructure to connect us. Nowhere else is that, of course, uh, be understood as, a, as well as in Europe, where, of course, the U European community lives already with 23 official languages, plus many dialects and uh, local regional languages. Um, we just talked yesterday in the panel discussion that that is something that holds back Europe because it generates fragmentation between countries and therefore makes markets less accessible. So it, we keep prodding the European, and please help us lobby because I think this is one of the key areas that has to improve in Europe because you know technology clearly is an is a, um, enabling technology for making this happen and uh, creating a better European infrastructure as a result. Today, it's still done mostly by human effort. If you come into the European Parliament, there are all these booths of people translating or uh, interpreting by human way. But if you really look in the rest of Europe, a common argument that's being made, doesn't everyone speak English? Should we just simply improve English teaching and then everyone speaks English? It's not only rude to expect every European. And uh, uh, we had one funny, um, uh, presentation by a journalist from The Economist and he said you know that that would never happen and and then people said why and he says well first of all it would not happen because of the French the French would never <laughs> uh, tolerate English and now once you have French you know then the Spaniards will say you know wait wait a second we are the most commonly spoken language and much more common than English and et cetera, et cetera, and then you go down the list, and in the end, of course, everyone will say, and to make matters worse, the, the one language, English, that everyone speaks in Europe is now leaving the European Union, you know? <laughs> so, so what's going on in Europe, you know? You can, and it's also not practical. You see that about only 40% of people speak it well enough that they can, can do business. So it's got to have a solution. And uh, uh, in our opinion, technology provides a wonderful solution and it, an effective solution, except we have to make sure we solve the technical problems and also the human interface and the human productization problems. So it's something that I started actually in the 70s already. Where I proposed this to my uh, uh, advisor at MIT to build a speech translation system. And he just, of course, he knew how hard this was in the 70s, and, and I didn't as a student. So he just, instead of saying, you're totally nuts, Alex, or, you're fired, he just said, oh, that sounds wonderful, Alex, but now go back and work on your uh, morph decomposition algorithm. We did work on text-to-speech synthesis at the time, which was to me exciting and a step in that direction. And I later went then to Carnegie Mellon to do the automatic recognition part, and then later to Japan to work on machine translation. So gradually these pieces came together, and it be ended up being a 25-year uh, labor of love to, to finally make that realize and build a system that you can really talk into in one language, have someone else hear it in their language, and for them to respond. Now, why was this so hard? Um, for those of you who are not language people, uh, you should realize that language is very ambiguous. Nothing that you say or read, etc., always has a unique uh, interpretation. And that was understood relatively early, and there are, of course, many jokes. Uh, this one comes from the early days when they tried to build Russian systems in the Cold War, and uh, uh, an article in the New Yorker claimed that a, 
a general tried to uh, translate the sentence, spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak from the Bible. It's, of course, a philosophical medi meaning, and apparently, or it's claimed that it translated it as the vodka is good, but the meat is rotten. And then uh, syntax is ambiguous, time flies like an arrow. Noam Chomsky found that there are actually six different passes to parse this sentence. And in phonetics, we have similar lots of little jokes where we can say that, you know, something that you say, this machine can recognize speech, can have two different uh, uh, descriptions, or give me a new display. What are you talking about? New displays or new displays? Uh, they are pronounced the same way. And all of language is constantly this way. And often it's the source of many jokes when we get actually confused on these things. Now, how do we deal with all of this is when you have all this ambiguity, it of course goes into, into the um, grammatical level too. Centralo Europa, that is one of those, uh, uh, Centralo Europa in German means it's compounding, it's Central Europe, right? Central Europa. But if you cut it in different ways, Centrale means, means that's the headquarter, and uh, Opa is the grandpa. An Uropa is your great grandpa. So if you suddenly the translator comes up and says, headquarter great grandpa, you wonder what the heck did happen here? And it comes from these ambiguities. Or if the baby is, uh, does not like the milk, boil it. What did you actually uh, mean? Uh, also, that is something that is totally obvious to a human being. Uh, but, you know, to a machine, it's not obvious at all because it is actually a structural ambiguity. And the way you and I disambiguate these things is because of all of our world knowledge in our heads, the contextual information that we know that you don't boil babies, that you boil milk, and uh, that talking about grandpas in a political speech doesn't make sense, etc., etc. What does it mean to not make sense? And that is where we're at the core of, of real hardcore AI problems. And when we get to these things, it is this ambiguity. First of all, we learn that we can't say things in a hard-coded way. We have ex to express things in scores, statistics, or neural activation, so because we're never really sure. And uh, that, again, was attempted initially. We, yesterday, we talked about expert systems. You know, people tried to do this by rules and gave up because it was just way too complex. The number of interactions between the facts and, and facts and little relationships you have in speech and language are so enormous that there's really a no hope uh, other than doing this by automatic learning algorithms. And indeed, that's what you and I do as human beings. If I ask you exactly why did you interpret something in a particular way, or if I asked you how do, did you drive your car to home last night, and you had to ex describe to me in rules exactly how you turned the steering wheel at each corner, you wouldn't be able to do it because you learned it. Your brain learned in many different ways the small little interactions that make us actually act and function uh, correctly. And this, of course, learning depends uh, critically on data and computing. So why did it take 25 years? Largely, and that's humbling for us who've been in the field, uh, the lack of computing and, uh, and data. And that's, of course, uh, changed over, over time tremendously. When neural networks came around in the 80s, I tinkered as part of my PhD thesis with perceptrons, and I said, why are people not taking this much more seriously with perceptrons? Because this is so cool to learn these things. And of course, they are only linear devices, and so they, we couldn't go very far. But sure enough, uh, Jeff Hinton just at the time joined us on the faculty at CMU, and uh, he introduced me to the Boltzmann machines and backpropagation. I said, wow, this is it. We have to have these kinds of machines which automatically learn uh, an, a behavior that is highly nonlinear. So they create a very nonlinear uh, classifica classification of function, function approximator, a behavior that you can simply ask the thing to learn. And it will learn it in, uh, as a very nonlinear uh, expression, very complex uh, relationships. But what I thought was even more exciting was that in addition to learning the outputs, it would actually create hidden representations, internal representations of how it would do it. And if you now looked at these things in detail, you, f you, will, you could find if it's an image, you can find uh, um, uh, edge detectors, and in speech you can find certain acoustic phonetic features if you train these things on real data. And we never told the system. So, so you tell it to do a certain behavior, and internally it develops knowledge that you never told it to, 
uh, to do. And that, to me, was a clear move in the right direction for artificial intelligence because, you know, that's what we do also as human beings when we do these complex things. We develop hidden, hidden knowledge that we can't even articulate all that well. So, of course, in speech, we thought, well, fine, let's just build classifiers by sticking speech in and uh, classifiers out. But in conversations with Jeff Hinton, I said, well, one of the big lessons we learned in speech is uh, that you can't just classify something when it's actually a moving signal. Because the moving signal then has to first be segmented so that you know where the signal is that you want to classify before you classify. So you first have to segment and then you have to classify. So you really have two classification problems. The first one that is a segmenter, finding the location of what it is you want to classify. And the second one is the classifier that classifies, does the actual classification. And that was traditionally always one of the things that killed many of the approaches in speech recognition because you compound two difficult problems on top of each other and then garbage in, garbage out. So we needed a me mechanism that did this all in one swoop. And so I went off to Japan and developed this thing called the time delay neural network, which had as the, probably the most important key aspect of it, a so-called shift invariant. So what you do is you train a neural network that in inherently is a network that's being shifted through speech. But then after you train it in all different positions, you remove the positional dependence by averaging all the weights that are uh, uh, that are just shifted positions of it, right? So you train lots of neural networks over, the, over time, and then you say, guess what? I don't know where it happened, and I remove the positional dependence by averaging all the corresponding weights, and I, and I iterate. And that weight sharing was the key ingredient here called shift invariance that allowed us then to train such network in a shift invariant or position independent way. The other aspect, of course, of it was that each, each layer, it had a certain context. So you don't just put in speech of a particular context at the bottom and then have a neural network, but you also use contexts of, context of activations of those neurons at the higher layer, and so always have a certain contextual uh, view at each level of this neural network. So these two ingredients were a key element of this time delay neural network, contextual um, awareness at each layer and a shift invariance in the classification. And that turned out to work wonderfully. We ran tests against HMMs, and this was all in the late 80s, early 90s. We've looked at the hidden representations, and lo and behold, we found acoustic phonetic features that linguists had told us for years were important for humans to listen to. And it was like, hooray, we never told this network to pay attention to form and transitions after a stop consonants, for, for, for example. And here we found actually units that learned to do those. Super exciting. We then tinkered with two-dimensional time delay neural networks to deal with speaker differences. When speakers uh, are female, male, etc., their spectra shift up and down in, in frequency. And so again, having two-dimensional time delay neural networks gives you a shift in variance not only in time, but also shift in variance in frequency. And that all was all published in 1990. Now, of course, fast forward to today, what happened, first of all? You know, this was all was in 1990, 1987, and what happened for 10, 20 years, and now all of these sudden these things are becoming fancy. We were, this little network here was something that took, uh, I had to run up and down to Tokyo to run this on the fastest supercomputer I could get my hands on in Tokyo. And it's by now a network that is so tiny that we can run it on our smartphones easily. Uh, and so the thing that has happened in the difference is um, computing. Also, we just never did more than two hidden layers. Why? A, we couldn't compute it. And B, the mathematicians told us that in theory, you could represent every non any nonlinear function with just one hidden layer. So the mathematicians really screwed us up for 20 years. Uh, <laughs> Because now what people find out is, wow, you know, if you do this actually with lots of hidden layers, it keeps improving by just adding more hidden layers into it. And that's where the name Deep Network now comes from, is because now have many hidden layers in between. And uh, indeed, you could do this all with one hidden layer, but it's very difficult for a network to learn this in one swoop when you actually have to build multiple 
um, layers of representation or multiple levels of abstraction, but you could do it. So what's different uh, if we go from today, to, from uh, 1987 to 2013, uh, my, my joke here is always is the number of weights went up by um, roughly a million at least. Uh, the, no, the amount of training data we now use is certainly, um, uh, sorry, a rough a factor of thousand. And the amount of training data is also rough, a roughly a factor of thousand at least. It's of course increasing. The only thing that hasn't changed is the time we're willing to wait for a result as researchers. We, all, you know, we get impatient after one week and then we just sort of don't consider anything that takes more than a week of training time because then we couldn't publish our papers, etc. <laughs> so if you think about this simple little human factor that, that we as researchers are simply limited by this one week w window, which is ridiculous limitation in a, in a way, in a, a cosmic scale, that is limit, limiting what sorts of algorithms we come up with. Now, if, if you imagine now, in, uh, if, if you kids get older uh, in 20, 30 years, you can expect another billion uh, in, in computing ex uh, acceleration. What sorts of algorithm would we then come up with? In any event, the vision community also discovered these, uh, these types of shift ne invariant networks, and then uh, people started writing about neural networks in the vision community and started calling them convolutional neural networks because in uh, images, of course, you're not really talking about time and frequency. You're talking about x, uh, x and y coordinates, but the same problem exists here too. Rather than trying to classify the entire image, what you, uh, what you want to do is you want to have local little receptive fields and take the combinations of these receptive fields and uh, detect them in a shift invariant way such that you can do a large classification of objects in a space where you don't necessarily know uh, when, where it's actually happening. And so, again, there are many pictures, of course, of uh, detecting uh, numbers in streets or images with objects. And so uh, the famous thing that, co that caused quite a steer is then when uh, Jeff Hinton <coughs> and company did this on uh, image classification and actually won all the, um, all the benchmarks. So the algorithms are really pretty much the same, but with a new computing, and uh, with the amount of data we now have, suddenly uh, neural networks got such a head start or improvement in performance in the years that we haven't considered them that after 10 years suddenly they give you something like an improvement of 30% relative, relative to others. And that's, by the way, also holding true with uh, self-driving cars. This was a neural net self-driving car in 1989 at Carnegie Mellon, the so-called NavLab by Dean Pomelo, which already steered itself with a neural network, uh, but again with a very tiny one by today's standards. Now time delay neural networks have been rediscovered also for reverberant speech. Um, here's an example of that. Uh, Microsoft has published a breakthrough uh, result on actually achieving human performance or, or exceeding human performance on a very hard uh, set, the, the switchboard set. And, um, and again, they also use convolutional neural networks. And then, of course, AlphaGo also uses convolutional neural networks. So you see this actually popping up everywhere. Recurrent nets, same story in a way. They existed all already also in the 80s and 90s, except they were even more painful to train because they're so slow uh, that they have really only had uh, enormous impact recently, uh, in, in particular for machine translation, where we build encoder, decoder networks, and you'll hear more about these sorts of things uh, in this uh, conference. Okay, so let me skip through this, but again, d dwell a little on this slide, where you see here the, the enormous improve in, in computing power, which is driving all of this. And again, in my lifetime alone, you know, this has been just billions uh, of uh, factors of computing which has uh, made this possible. Here, look at this storage, five megabyte uh, in 1956. So this certainly has changed. Now, data, uh, interesting to note that we are now training all of machine translation and ASR systems on more than a billion words, easily, gigawort corpora. And uh, the, if you just, again, 
Note that this is twice as much than what a human speaks in their lifetime. We as humans speak in our entire life about half a billion words and we're training all of our systems already on much, much more on this. And that's once again leads to this assumption, what will actually happen when these algorithms achieve superhuman performance uh, when they in fact have access to data that humans will never have access to and, uh, and also computing. All right, let me just, uh, since I got the evil eye here with, with my time, uh, uh, time uh, management here, uh, I want to just very quickly show you just pictures of some of the applications, how we actually took this into the field on this particular problem of speech translation, which has been an uh, area of research for a long time. And here again, we worked on three different styles of delivery. One is the consecutive translation of dialogues, which is I say something, it translates, you answer, it translates, etc. We carry on a dialogue. Dialogue and the simultaneous translation, which is what we're doing recently quite a bit, which is when uh, a lecturer, a lecturer like now, if you wanted to, for example, follow this lecture in Italian, we could do that, uh, where you get a, co a continuous stream of translation as the speaker speaks. And i uh, just show you a few pictures. So these were our early starts. In 1992, we had our first demos of a video conference speech translator of dialogue. These were just very small vocabulary systems. Took a while to compute and was slow and workstations, not, not very practical. 25 years later, we had it then down to a system that could fit on a phone on the uh, iPhone 3GS was our first breakthrough. We did this in the context of a startup company called Jibigo, where we built the world's first speech translator on a phone, uh, never done before. And so it got a lot of interesting press and, uh, uh, and um, Apple then ran commercials. How do we turn this up? Where's the train station? All I really needed was my iPhone and my passport. Okay, so um, again, Apple ran this commercial, economists and other magazines wrote about it. The company was acquired in 2013 here by Facebook. Here's, you see our team joining the Facebook team. And uh, we started building language translation at Facebook. So the, when you see translation and so on, it's, it's been developed by the team that and, uh, came and joined uh, with Facebook. We also worked at humanitarian deployments for many years, where you to bring this uh, into the field in uh, exercises in Thailand, where you have dialogues with patients in, in, uh, who speak different languages, Cambodia, uh, Honduras, with uh, friendly doctors. And recently we're working on, uh, for refugees, translation into uh, Arabic for uh, servicing this in, uh, in uh, humanitarian situations. The interesting thing in all of these is it's really there and really useful because almost everyone today has a smartphone. This was an eye-opener also in Thailand and Honduras, etc. People have never used glasses. People it was important to explain what a bifocal is because they never had seen bifocals all their life long, but they all had smartphones and they all had telephones to communicate. Expensive so, ones. yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, okay. So this is the dialogue system that we developed. Uh, we also have been for many years working on this uh, problem of. Um, simultaneous interpretation. Simultaneous interpretation is different in the sense that you don't know where the sentences begin and where they end. The speaker continues speaking and you can't wait until the end before you start the translation. The translation has to roll as the human is actually speaking. That makes it hard for humans and for machines alike because you don't know where to segment or where the, where the bunch is that you want to translate. But it, if you think about it for a while, it makes it particularly hard for a human because a human has to remember what you said a second ago, uh, speak what you have spoken a second ago, and already listen to the next sentence while they're speaking the old sentence. 
for humans, that's very hard task to do, and it's cognitively very difficult. And that's why actually human interpretation is one of the most difficult tasks, and they get very tired after 15 minutes. Now, machines don't care. You can put like 20 machines that listen to the 20 last sentences, and you can have, uh, have them just run all night long if you want. And so, in some sense, machine have, machines have a key advantage here, and we're seeing this actually in the res results. We have such a system running in Karlsruhe now. It was first shown as a prototype 2005, and we have a service running since 2012, which is actually available for students. So if you come to Karlsruhe and you attend a lecture and you don't know German, uh, the lecturer will wear a, a microphone, and if they gave us permission to do so, all of this is done in the cloud. Uh, the students just simply open their laptop and uh, go to a particular URL, and then they see uh, continuously the uh, transcription of what the speaker said coming out and the translation into English and uh, in the future also Arabic and Chinese. Um, so again, this is all done in the cloud, and here's what it looks like when we run this. Now with this, let me begin my talk. It is, of course, well understood in this crowd that we are living in a global village. We do work together, and increasingly, the world is globalizing. We um, practice exchange and communication, and uh, in Europe in particular, it is a mandate for all of Europe to integrate, uh, regardless of language. Uh, so you see, this is really how it works. When you're sitting in the lecture hall and you have your laptop open, this is what you get. On the left, you get the transcript. On the right, you get the translation. And you see it's good enough that people can actually follow and follow the content of what was said. Uh, what I'd like to draw your attention to is also it has to insert punctuation, because I never say comma and period. And we found this is incredibly disruptive if you don't have periods and commas to read the text when it just comes out as the speaker says. And it's also the same thing with disfluencies. When people really speak, they will stutter, etc. And when they do that, it becomes very difficult to follow it along when you see it in text. So we have to not only transcribe, not only translate, but you have to clean up, summarize, insert punctuation, and do a whole bunch of things like that. So this obviously created a lot of interest. We're now sell, uh, distributing this to other universities so that they can also run this service. We also developed a good relationship with the European Parliament. Not that they are uh, overly eager to be replaced by machines. And so this is obviously, uh, I say this facetiously, because we clearly do not intend and we do not believe that this is, will actually be the case. Like in many situations, uh, like what you're in fact doing this is why I, why I love what Marco uh, uh, and uh, Marcello and others have done uh, is to combine the human element with the machine element, right? That, I think this is where the where the where the the sweet spot is, and so and they get that we get that machines are not as good in those interpretation tasks as uh, as humans are, and uh, uh, and the, the question is how do we really combine their expertise? And so we have uh, you know, a number of projects that we're doing with them that help them, in fact, to help the humans to do their interpretation tasks more effectively. Now I really get the evil eye. OK. So uh, again, I'll leave you with this. This is what conversational speech really looks like when people speak. You have the disfluencies, the ers, the ums, you, the periods are not in there, the commas are not in there. And this is when you really do perfect transcription, no errors here. And so it clearly is still a computing task or an interpretation task to turn that into readable text. And this is actually what a lot of our research is, is um, aimed at. Uh, just for entertainment, this is what you get in German. Fehler, Stromschutz, Halterprüfung, Nummern, Schilddruck, etc. Right? <laughs> uh, another thing that uh, yesterday we had a conversation on, are lectures harder than uh, broadcast news? Lectures are harder, in my opinion, because you get a lot of, lot of special terms in lectures, and each lecture has different special terms. And then you get that folded into into declinations of foreign words. So you have a f foreign words like cloud, iPhone, iPad, laser, which are pronounced in German the English way, 
but then they de get declinated in the German way, so you get something like web recasted, down geloaded, cloud basierta webcast zugriff, where you're mix mixing English words with German words and you're declinating them with the German way. So this is really tough to deal with. And, uh, and then, of course, porting this to many other languages. She comes closer and closer, so <laughs> I, uh, before I get hit, uh, I, I stop here. So uh, this one, of course, is still a big issue. How do you do, do, do this in many languages? And so uh, quite a bit of our research is now also aimed at multilingual translation. How do we do this uh, not requiring a system for every language pair anymore? Okay, thanks so much. <laughs>